Yamanobi stum stop di tum yena butile, swayam rupa, kadam mayam, the dati swam, padanti cum. Bandeham, shiguro, shiuta, padekamalam, shigurun, vaishnavamscha, shirupam, sagrajatam, sahaganat, raganatam, vitam, tam, sajivam, sadvaitam, sarvadutam, parijana sahitam, Krishna chaitanya devam, Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahaganat Lalita Sri Visha Kam Vitamscha. Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Swari Rikabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vansha Kalpa Tarubhischa Kripa Sindhu Paevacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhunitananda Sri Advaita Gadar Har Sri Vasari Gaur Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare hmm. I seem to be entered into somebody's room here uh, on my screen, somebody has appeared. Is that the way it's supposed to be? Or should everyone uh, turn off their videos? <laughs> um, I guess devotees uh, can, can maybe turn off their cameras. Uh... They should turn off their cameras because otherwise I'd be looking at different people. <laughs> um, it can I can see them in the small blocks above, but if they put on complete video video then I um, I'm watching them yeah okay so we're going to begin and uh, as we are following the protocol the um, topic is Mahabharat <laughs> and it's interesting because we have such a wide range of uh, uh, what we say uh, topics to choose from, events to choose from, uh, situations. It is quite a uh, voluminous uh, scripture. In fact, it is one of the most voluminous spiritual scriptures in the world. It's six times bigger than the Iliad and the Odyssey. And it comprises the lives of kings, sadhus, uh, heroes, very degraded persons, and also the Supreme Personality of God. It is also there. That's what makes the Mahabharata what it is. So um, we know as Vaishnavas, we have the Mahabharata, we have Ramayan. And we have Srimad Bhagavatam, which we might consider to be uh, three of the main scriptures that deal with so the activities of the personality of Godhead. Um, each one has a particular focus in terms of what it, it's presenting and along with the topics of the Supreme Lord and his devotees. For the Mahabharat, it's just like what you want to read when you wake up in the morning. <laughs> It's hardcore activity. It gives you a sense of what is virtue, what is vice. Uh, it's full of intrigue, romance, war, and a lot of the qualities that Vaishnavas want to stay away from, such as lust, anger, greed, illusion, pride, envy. There's a lot of that in, in many of the pastimes. So you might say, it's like uh, Mahabharata is, gives you more or less, the conclusion of Mahabharata is what to avoid and what to take on as far as one's qualities in life. It talks a lot about qualities and really hardcore activity. The Ramayan is more like characters and personalities who are great characters. Even from both sides, you had demons and you had devotees, and you have those who are siding with the demons, those who are siding with the devotees. It's about character, it's about values, it's about uh, how to lead 
in any position of life, whether you're a mother, a father, a teacher, a guru, or anyone who has leadership position, there's a lot of values in there, a lot of uh, what we say, teachings. What is ideal leadership? And we saw that in Lord Ram himself. And then we can speak just, we just mentioned Srimad Bhagavatam is really all about devotion to Krishna. It's how, how to love. So you might say Mahabharata is how to live. Ramayana is how to lead. And Srimad Bhagavatam is how to love like that. So there's one, there's many, many stories which have many powerful lessons. I chose this one. It's a little dialogue. M mostly it's a question and then a dialogue by the answer. It's from Mahabhar Adipavar Parva, chapter 90. And there's one king called King Astaka. And he wants to ask a question regarding the destination of life. And especially in destination in one's next life. So he is approaching one great king called Maharaj Yayati. And he asks, how can one attain higher destination in one's next life? That is the question. Maharaj Yayati answers, austerity, charity, peacefulness, self-control, modesty, simplicity, and mercy to all living entities are the seven gates that lead to higher realms. Mm -hmm. Saintly persons say that these gates are destroyed if one becomes blinded by pride. Mm -hmm. So now, after stating some of the destinations of the higher realms, he says all these things are lost if one becomes proud. Mm -hmm. He goes on to say, one who studies Vedic knowledge and proudly considers himself a pundit and then uses that learning to defeat and humiliate, humiliate others, finds himself in a situation where his attainment to higher realms is temporary. His knowledge, too, does not bring the highest fruit. King Ayati continues. He goes on to say four activities, fire sacrifice, control of speech, study of Shastra, and worship of the Lord bestow fearlessness. However, he goes on to say, if these four activities are performed out of pride, then these very activities become the source of fear. So first he states the four activities. One performs Agni Hotra, sacrifice, in order to bring auspiciousness and a certain you know, desired result. One who learns how to control speech, which is a very great virtue. Study of the Shastras, study not only reading, but studying Shastras, knowing Shastras, be able to recite Shastras, be able to live according to Shastra. And worship of the Lord, all these things give fearlessness. However, when one becomes proud due to the activities that one performs based on these four activities, one becomes fearful. Hmm. So how pride turns something auspicious into something completely opposite. Although the activity remains auspicious, this, it's just like when you have sweet rice, and if you put a little bit of sand in the sweet rice, then what do you have? you have a whole different thing, and then nobody wants it anymore. It becomes ruined. And he goes on to say, an intelligent person should not be elated upon being praised, nor become angry upon being insulted. One should be tolerant, knowing that only saintly persons recognize and honor the saintly, while materialist persons can never recognize a sadhu. So now he's saying, yeah. One should be equipoised because people will sometimes praise you and sometimes say things that will be insulting or offensive. One has to learn tolerance. 
real, real, realizing that most people cannot recognize a sadhu or a, a great person. Only a saintly person can recognize another saintly person. And mere materialistic persons will always be inclined to you know, act in this dualistic way, giving praise and giving insult. He goes on to say, now he's doing, speaking rhetorically. I have so much ch charity I gave. I performed so many sacrifices. I studied so many books. I executed so many vows. Such statements are full of fear and should be totally given up. But here's another interesting point. The one who becomes good at a particular activity and receives some uh, remuneration for that activity, either in the form of praise, uh, congratulations, some honor, or maybe one receives some uh, material numerations in the form of getting some position or some, some uh, finances. He says, but proud, pride destroys the whole thing. Then he goes on, and this is the ending. He says, may Lord Vishnu, who is the shelter of everything, who was the oldest and ever knew, and who was unapproachable by mental speculation, bestow the ultimate benefit upon you. Intelligent persons who have given up that bad quality of pride know him to be able to establish their relationship with him. They can know him and they can establish their relationship with him. And in the next life and in this world are able to attain the highest peace. King Iyati ends there. So here we see uh, we a lot of a mention of good qualities and how these good qualities are sought after by people in general and also by even saintly persons or persons engaged in devotional practice. But that element of pride seems to cause everything to go the opposite way. As it mentions in the Shastras, pride goes before the fall. <laughs> so this is a very, what we say, subtle aspect of, of one's consciousness where one can actually not even realize, but still become very proud. Well, we have the example in the Mahabharata also, that Duryodhana, he was proud. He had pushed the Pandavas out, and now he was in a situation of rule. And he was using his position uh, to uh, give more harassment to the Pandavas. Um, he thought he was invincible. He had the support of many armies, including Bhishma Dev himself. That's a whole other point in the story. And of course, Karna, Karna and Bhishma were indefeatable in battle. And Bhishma especially could only die when he wanted. And Karna, he had his invincible armor, which would give him complete freedom from death. And so he became so proud. And so there was a test given between him and uh, Unistir. Unistir is known as the opposite. Unistir, although he was he was decorated with all good qualities, of course he had the support of the supreme personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna Himself. Um, he was, you know, uh, qualified in so many ways. So both were asked a question. They said to Duryodhana, Duryodhana. Go out and find someone, anyone, ask everyone if they can, you can find someone who is better than you. Go and try to find someone who is better than you. And for you to stare, they said, go out and find someone who is lesser than you. Um, so... Both came back with the same answer, I couldn't find anyone. Diodna couldn't find anyone that was better than him. 
And Yudhisthira couldn't find anyone who was lesser than him. So we see the difference between real good qualities and person who may have so many outstanding qualities, but this element of pride. There's also a story in the Mahabharata, and which is related to a story in the Srimad Bhagavatam of King Nahusa. King Nahusa was a very powerful and magnanimous and very compassionate person. He was uh, ruling in the heavenly realms, in the realms of the demigods. Indra got himself in trouble with uh, when he killed uh, Ritrasura. And because he had killed a Brahmana, he had he was being afflicted by Brahma, you know, the Brahmahatya. In other words, he had to atone for his offense of killing a Brahmana. Although the Brahmana was a demon, still he was still was a Brahmana. And so Indra had to leave the heavenly realm, and uh, you know, go inside a stem of a lotus flower and lived there for one year. And therefore there was nobody to manage the heavens. And so the demigods were looking for someone qualified. They came against King Nahusa. So Nahusa, he immediately agreed to accept the position while Indra was there. Indra was to be, to, to be gone for one full year. And so now he's ruling the heavens. And, uh, but now he gets a little bit proud of his position. And although he had so many good qualities, he was compassionate, he was a good fighter, he gave in charity, he was respected amongst the demigods. He, had, he was loved by everyone. Now when he took the position, he became a little bit infatuated by Indra's wife, Sachi Devi and wanted to have union with Sachi Devi. Of course, uh, this was intolerable. And so when Sachi Devi found out, she wasn't interested in it. But King Nahusa was very much pushing the whole thing. And so um, Lord Brahma said, all right, you can participate in this activities, but you must approach her riding on a palaquin carried by many sages and so he agreed so he got onto the palanquin and he was being carried and while he was being carried he one of the sages that was carrying him was augusta muni now augusta muni we'll speak about him in a later talk and as part of this series is not only a sage but he's a sage among the sages He's, he's extremely, extremely powerful. So uh, when a Nahusa was being carried along, he hung his foot over the side of the palaquin, and the foot hit Augusta Muni. Augusta Muni was really not very happy with that. And so he cursed Nahusa that you're acting like a, you know, a snake. So become a snake. And so immediately he fell from his position and had to take a body of a giant python. Hmm. So now Nahusa is no longer king of heaven. He committed the offense of wanting to chase after Indra's wife, who wasn't agreeable in the first place. And now he commits another offense. It's interesting to see how that when one has a lot of position and power, it's very easy to, to offend others. <laughs> uh, well, therefore, one has to be very much careful that whatever position I have, one always has to cultivate this proper mood of service to others and not become proud of one's position. Tomorrow we'll speak about another event which is related to this, which is quite interesting, which is also part of the Mahabharat. So this element of pride as Prabhupada writes in the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, that pride yeah, destroys all of one's good qualities. We have the another example of Nalukuvera and Manigriva, 
who are sons of Kuvera, the, uh, the treasurer of the demigod. He was so rich, Kuvera, that he even lent money to Krishna, who was in the form of a beggar when he wanted to remarry the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi Devi, after both of them had fallen to the material world due to the offense of uh, Brigamuni when he kicked uh, uh, Lord Vishnu in the chest. L Lakshmi Devi got angry. She left the, heaven, the heavenly realm, or she left Vaikuntha and came to the material world. The Lord was without his Lakshmi. He came after her. He started chasing after her, but he, he became a beggar. He was in the mood of a beggar. So at one point they meet, and this is a very long story. This is the whole story of Vantekeshwar and Balaji, Tirupati. And then uh, the Lord wants to again marry Lakshmi, but Lakshmi's got high taste, and he has nothing. So he borrows money off uh, Kuvera. So we can see the position of Kuvera. He's, he he's actually lends money to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, in this particular Leela anyway. Of course, it was just a Leela. But it just shows what his position is. So being the sons of this very powerful treasurer, they were proud of their position. And so they started to sport with young girls in the Mandakini River, Mandaki River, which was in the higher planets. And they were not even embarrassed. They were intoxicated. They were without clothes, swimming in around with these girls. And all of a sudden, the great sage among the sages, Sri Narada Muni, comes I know, coming along. He just happens to be there. It's interesting. Narada Muni appears at the right time, at the right place, always. And uh, he sees the scene. The girls realize of their embarrassing situation. They take precautions. But these two brothers who were, uh, you know, uh, sons of Kuvera, they could practically ignored the presence of this great sage, and still they acted in their embarrassing uh, display. And so he cursed them. And therefore, when he cursed them, he said, you have to become trees. Of course, the curse was mitigated or lessened that they, they when they begged forgiveness, he said, you can become trees in the, in the courtyard of Yana, Nanda Maharaj, and after a, a hundred celestial year, hundred years, hundred years, I'm not sure if it was celestial or hundred years of earth time, then the Lord, Lord will come and free you from that. And Prabhupada writes in this particular, uh, what we say, uh, incident that there are different kinds of pride. We can list some of the pride. If one is austere, sometimes they become proud of their own austerities because when you get austerity and you, you become powerful. And when you become powerful, you can also become pride, pride, prideful of that power. Pride of beauty. Beauty is also a, a outstanding quality. And people, because of good karma in previous lives and even activities in this life, they develop you know, good physical beauty. And we see that people will even use their beauty in order to become famous or to, to get some monetary remuneration. So beauty is a sense that can cause pride. Austerity can cause pride. Position can cause pride. If one has a position in society or even within the, the society of devotees, whatever that position it may be, if they're in charge of others, they also might feel that because they are in, they have that position, it is due to their own, you know, endeavors, and then they become a little bit proud. And then when they become proud, they commit offenses to others. And then, of course, there are different kinds of pride. Sometimes we even say that even a, a pauper, he becomes proud of his penny. He doesn't have much, but he's proud of even the little bit he may have. So pride is something that comes on very easily and something that's very hard to shake or to even recognize in some cases. Now, out of all the sense of pride, the pride of wealth is the most binding of all pride. And that's illustrated by that story of 
Manigriva and Nalo Kuvara. And so we see that position and uh, great learning, that's also a form of pride that can develop, can bring about one to have more and more wealth. But wealth is the most binding and most difficult of all pride. Therefore, it says that if one wears a big crown on their head, it is very hard to pay obeisances. <laughs> Why? Because one becomes somewhat infatuated by whatever they have, and they think, well, I have money, I can go anywhere, I can do anything, I can control people, I can get whatever I want. And so, this pride. So, in Vaishnav circles, we, we see that, you know, it may also happen. A devotee may also feel some pride because of whatever he, they have done or whatever they have, uh, uh, whatever position they have achieved or whatever, whatever learning they have, whatever. So one has to be very, very conscious. And therefore, it says that uh, uh, two things you should always, uh, you should always forget. Two things you should always forget, two things you should always remember. This is coming from Sri Sampradaya, which is one of the authorized Vaishnav Sampradayas. Two things you should always remember, or forget, I'm sorry. You should forget all the good things you've done for others. <laughs> Not so easy. Sometimes we want to remember that, and it makes us feel good, and it makes it sometimes even inspires us to do more. But sometimes because of that, we can become proud and think we are the good, do, we can do good to others. As Prabhupada says, no one can do good to anyone. But if Krishna empowers a person to do good to another person, then that person becomes the recipient of the activity and they get the benefit of doing good to another person. But actually, it's Krishna who's empowered that person. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, I am the ability in all living entities. So Krishna might choose someone to do good to you or uh, choose you to do good to someone else, but it's Krishna behind the scenes who is actually inaugurating the whole thing based on the, the interaction of the material energy and how it's working to bring two people together. But it's always Krishna behind the scenes. He is the remote cause of everything. That's mentioned in the Brahma Samhita. Every cause has two causes. One is the remote cause and one is the immediate cause. The immediate cause is what we see when, two, when something happens and the remote cause is behind the scenes. Krishna is working either directly for his devotee. He works directly for those who, who are his devotees or engage in devotional service. And for those non-devotees, he works indirectly through the material energy. Hmm. And so, yeah, behind the scenes, Krishna is there to do to make things happen or not make things happen like that. And uh, the th another thing is, one should forget all the bad things people have done to you. <laughs> this is another principle that is important. Because this uh, remembrance of all these things that other people have done to us or unpleasant causes our mind to become disturbed. We might develop some enmity or some bad feelings towards others. Or we, in other words, it becomes really difficult to practice spiritual life when we hold negativity towards anyone. So one should do whatever is required. And there are many what we say, avenues that one can go down to rectify a situation. But if you can't rectify your situation, as it says, become tolerant and just accept it as the mercy of the Lord. And the two things you should always remember, and these are quite easy to understand. We can remember that death can happen at any moment. Uh, right now we're in a situation where it's become quite pr likely that you know, death is uh, creeping up in a larger way all around the world. And so now the general population is becoming more and more aware of the fact that 
this material body can go at any time. So devotees always know that because we know that by remembering death can happen at every time, a devotee becomes more serious in the execution of their devotional service and does not waste time. Wasting time means wasting something very valuable. And what is that valuable thing that the most precious thing we have is our time in devotional service. And so whatever time we have left in this life, we want to use in the best possible way to uh, reach perfection at the time of, that we're meant to leave this body and then go back home and back to Godhead like that. So one should always remember that death can happen at any moment. And the other thing, one should always remember Krishna by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So back to our topic, which is, you know, this principle of success Success can bring pride. As one great devotee said, every time you do something and people notice it and give you some, uh, what we say, congratulations, some praise, some kijais or whatever. In other words, you should know I'm in a dangerous situation. <laughs> so what, of course, that dangerous situation is mitigated and ultimately destroyed when one realizes that I am not the doer, everything is done through the mercy of the Lord. As Krishna, we mentioned before, Krishna says, I am the ability in all living entities. And we also understand that wherever and whenever activity is being performed, there are many factors that make up the activity. And the person who performs the activity is just a small part of the whole activity. And ultimately, the results are given by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So these are our, uh, some, and therefore, when, the, when a devotee gets some reason to become proud, he always says, all glories to my spiritual master, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Not only says that, but thinks deeply within, that is by the grace of the spiritual masters, the grace of the Lord that had the chance to perform this activity, and because of that, they have also given me the intelligence and the ability to carry it out. Or whatever I have is due to their mercy also. Therefore, a devotee gives, gives when we say, all credit to others. Hmm. I see a question popping up. Should I take the question at this point? I think I'm ready for the question, if everybody is. How should we deal with praise? That's the question. Yeah. Well, it says that, uh, you know, one who is not elated when there is praise or one who is not discouraged or unhappy when there is criticism is one of the features of a transcendental person. And so... We pass it on. We don't reject praise. In other words, we don't say, oh, you shouldn't praise me. No, accept the praise, but pass it on and realize you are simply an instrument for the mercy of the spiritual master, the Lord, like that. If you keep it, this is where the pride starts to develop. People like to praise. In fact, it says in the Shastras, in the, the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 28, verses 1 and 2. It's an interesting, verse 1 is the actual statement, where it says that one should not praise another, one should not criticize another. And then the understanding is because praise and criticism are all, all faulty. No one can see the whole picture, so whatever praise is there, whatever criticism is there, is never completely understood because no one can see the whole picture. But then it goes on to say in verse number two, but one can praise. So we see in Vaishnava circles, it becomes not only commonplace, 
but something to, to do to praise another devotee, to glorify another devotee like that. And this is, this is good for those who praise, but those who are receiving the praise should be very conscious of the fact that uh, it is not me, it is my spiritual master who gets the benefit. It is my, it's the Lord who gets the benefit, or it's the assemblies of devotees who are also here, they also. In other words, if you keep it, and then gradually, if you continue to keep it time after time, you'll find that it becomes part of one's consciousness and one thinks, oh, and then what happens when you don't get praised, then you think, what's wrong? Don't they know my good qualities? <laughs> so yeah, then uh, when one becomes accustomed to accepting praise and becomes uh, what we say infatuated by that, when it doesn't happen, they get angry. When it does, when they expect it, and it doesn't happen, and that causes one to uh, you know commit an offense like that. So therefore, yeah. Therefore, as we read in the very beginning of the uh, uh, talk, how King Gayati was saying, yes, there are so many good qualities, austerity, and then charity, and then what else did he say? Peacefulness, self-control, modesty, simplicity, merciful to all living entities. These are all good qualities, and we understand there are many more. But as soon as pride comes in, it takes that all that, that success that comes by way of these good qualities and turns it into the opposite. In other words, the success is no longer there. And Krishna doesn't like when people become proud because therefore one cannot approach the Supreme Lord. So the question from Preeti is, how do we give praise to others? Mm -hmm. Okay, good question. How do we give praise to others? Um, it should come naturally, and not. And there are sometimes devotees want to be known as uh, a nice guy, a nice, a nice lady, or whatever. And so we like to praise in order to be known as a a praiser. <laughs> so it should come naturally from the heart. And if you see something praiseworthy, you may praise like that but it shouldn't be what we say overly done they say that if one glorifies a person too much that's another form of insult <laughs> another form of insult so one has to be very what we say uh, conscious how to give praise and when to give praise like that but it should be natural. That's the most important thing. And devotees like to praise, praise other devotees. Someone gives a nice class. Someone gives a nice kirtan, leads a nice kirtan. Someone dresses the deities very nicely. Someone prepares a very nice preparation, and everyone is happy. The cook gets praised. Yes, praise can stimulate a person to continue to work hard to improve their service and to want to please the devotees more. So praise has a positive effect by giving the devotee inspiration in their service. But that's where the devotee can gain from praise. And But when it comes to the point where one accepts it, that I am the source of the results of my activities, as Krishna says, this is false ego in the... Uh, he says in the uh, third chapter that we are, you know, we are not the doer of activities. Okay, so any other questions? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Okay. Sri Radha. Otherwise, 
Yeah, generally that's the case. The one who uh, that one reflects their own good qualities on others, that is also true. But that's that's generally true, but not always. Sometimes one has one has such outstanding good qualities that one immediately becomes in response re attracted by that and says something to praise that person. But that's how that's how we should feel when someone praises us. We should say, well, because you know, because of your good qualities, you're seeing some good quality in me. Uh huh. That's um, yeah. That's also true. Not always. Sometimes people get angry, and but if you are involved with the situation which causes the anger, then then you can say that. Yeah, that is actually also true. It's not that everything reflects one's consciousness, but most of the cases it is. I mean, a person who has good qualities can see good qualities in others. A person who doesn't have any good qualities, it's hard for them to see any good qualities in others. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Sri Radha. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anyone else? For have a question from Facebook from Sachi Mata Dasi. Uh, it says, someone, someone, sometimes someone does a very nice thing to us or helps us. So it feels quite natural to praise this person out of gratefulness, out of gratitude. Um, we want to praise them. So what is the right measure of praise, I guess? Can I answer this? Because I'm on this, and this is, is this connected to here? No, I should, I'm on here. So, Mahaprabhu? Yeah, yeah, Mahaprabhu, um, we are also on a, another channel we're on Facebook where I am also and we're getting a question from there should I answer that question or should we just stick to our forum right here yeah okay so I'll repeat the question for every for the audience Re so the question is sometimes someone does a very nice thing to us or helps us so it feels quite natural to, uh, to someone praise does them. a very nice thing to us and then helps us and this feels very natural uh, it feels natural to praise this person out of gratefulness and so what is the right measure of praise we should give them well out of gratefulness we want to respond what is the might well the least amount of uh, praise the minimum should be thank you very much. <laughs> that way, that way we, we we're acknowledging the fact that they just did something to uh, help us. So we at least say thank you, <laughs> or show show in some way that we are reciprocal to their uh, to the activity they perform to us. That's just uh, that's common etiquette. <laughs> But to what degree that we should do that, I think we have to judge the situation accordingly. So depending on the person, depending on what was done, you might, you know, sometimes this like, you know, if you're in a position of leadership and one of the persons who you're leading does something for you, we, because that's their service, you may say thank you, but you don't go around making a big eulogy out of it because their service is to do things. <laughs> so those who have an obligation in relationship to others, we can also thank them for their service, 
but we don't make a big thing out of it. And, uh, you know, go on a long diatribe of eulogies. So I think everything, every situation has to be judged accordingly and not simply by there is a certain measured amount of praise or reciprocation in every case. It's everything. This is personal interaction. Personal interaction requires, you know, the ability to see the situation and act accordingly. <laughs> Okay. Do we have any more questions, Mahaprabhu? Badri Narayan? Hmm. Um, can be, yeah, I think it is. Because, yeah, any situation where something goes wrong, whoever participates in it also has some, what we say, uh, reaction in the results. So, yeah. So that's why you have to be careful. <laughs> and not only be careful, but, you know, but generally, it's not so serious like that. If the person somehow or other becomes proud because we give him some praise. Uh, the thing is, if we're always thinking like that, then what will happen to our society? Our society is based on inspiring others by glorifying. We glorify the devotees. We glorify the Lord. We glorify the spiritual master. But everything has to be done according to proper Vaishnav etiquette and according to the circumstance. So uh, there are people who like to praise, and there are people who never praise. <laughs> so, you know, it's like the fine line in glorifying others and not glorifying others, I think, is a matter of intelligence. But as the Shastras say, Glorification and criticism always fall short of the reality of the situation, but you can the second injunction, which is a which is a uh, adjustment to the original injunction, is that one should praise. So in much in much in Vaishnava circles, we do praise devotees. Like that. We usually thank the, we usually thank them. Uh, what is the what point in Mahabharat were you saying? Uh, is that somebody indirectly uh, causing, uh, facing the consequences of pricing and making others fall down? Hmm. Obviously, there is because Mahabharat is full of everything. <laughs> that I can say for sure, but I can't think of any incidents off the top of my head. Um, Uh, uh, well, you know, Duryodhana got praise, and because of that, it just increased his false ego <laughs> and increased his offenses against the uh, against the Pandavas. <laughs> um, King Dhritarashtra, he. Uh, he was so oblivious to the fact that his sons were nefarious that even though he knew his sons were nefarious, still he allowed his sons to go on in, with their nefarious activities. Even Krishna told him directly, <laughs> you know, you shouldn't support your own sons because, you know, they're against the Pandavas and the Pandavas are righteous, and but he couldn't. He couldn't handle it. He, he was so attached to his family members that even in the face of truth, he said, I, I know what you're saying is right, but I can't, I can't accept it. <laughs> 
So we have the example of the opposite, where one is told when something is wrong, and still they're warned, and because of that, they don't follow. Disaster happens because they don't follow, and still, you know, they didn't they didn't follow. They were warned by the supreme personality of Godhead Himself. So we see the example of one, one, it's not a matter of praising, it's a matter of giving good advice. So sometimes when even good advice to the wrong person or to a person who can't accept good advice causes, you know, that problem to become offensive, that person. So uh, Dita Rastra became more offensive to the Pandavas, even though he knew his sons were wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. That's very helpful. Thank you. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Vishalini Dasi. Hare Krishna. Can you... Thank you. Can you put your microphone a little bit louder? Because I'm hard. It's a little hard to hear you. Okay. Can you repeat that question? Okay. Well, praising could be a form of gratitude, but gratitude can come in other of other forms also. Gratitude is a, is, a, is a broader category, where praise is one way to show gratitude. <laughs> gratitude could be done by simply doing something for another for a person in reciprocation for what they did. Gratitude can uh, take the form of giving a gift to a person. It can take many forms, gratitude. But praise is what it is. It's just one form of showing gratitude. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Who? Of the chat, uh, the people have okay. Okay, we have how much time left do we have? Uh, Half hour, 15 minutes. 20 minutes. 20, 20 minutes, sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to try to answer the questions. Well, I think we got that. <laughs> we got that already. We tried to answer that. You know, you're not sure. You're not sure. But therefore, uh, if you know ahead of time it's going to go to their head, then you may just say thank you and do something uh, in a small way to reciprocate. <laughs> It is auspicious, and we should do that. And praise is a form of glorification, but glorification is more or less in line with a certain way to honor a devotee. So um, glorifying means to speak the good qualities of that devotee to others. Like that. Oh, this devotee, did you know he gave such and led a nice kirtan? So you can inspire others to feel happy that this devotee did something. So you can glorify the devotee. Glorification is just a broader sense of, of praise. That's all.
you know, glorification is like, well, we usually find the good qualities of a person and then we, the well, best way to glorify a person is to emulate the qualities that they're exhibiting. If you want to glorify Srila Prabhupada, and we do, we follow his instructions. That's, that's the best way to glorify Srila Prabhupada. Of course, there are other ways to glorify Prabhupada, but that will make Prabhupada the most happy when we follow his instructions. That's a glorification of Srila Prabhupada. <laughs> Another way to glorify the person is the same way as that if someone asks us to do something and we do it, and then uh, we they become happy because we carry it out, you know, that's a way to glorify that person. So glorification is a very, very wide range of things. Praise can is also can be done, but it has to be done naturally. This is the point. Don't be don't be a praise giver in the name of giving praise, you know. And of course the opposite is even worse, criticizing. <laughs> Anjali. Hare Krishna. As all the temple activities has been stopped, the preaching, book distribution, the child of distribution, many activities has been stopped. And the devotees are literally inside the house, we're not able to do much, we're not able to take darshan to worships. So what is the positive, like apart from reading and things we can do at home and go deeper in our sadhana? Um, when we see that preaching has been stopped, like as in going in uh, Harinam and book distribution, what is the positive we can take it from if we see the situation from Krishna's eyes? Why is this happening and why would Krishna would stop something like this, which is very positive and uh, basically spreading uh, Lord Chaitanya's message? So why would this will be stopped for this long time. Well, there's a, I'll give you a general statement to answer your question, then I'll try to answer your question. The general statement is nothing material can stop devotional service. Devotional service is not, is on the transcendental platform. It's above the material. So devotees might have to adjust because of circumstances and situations, but devotees never stop their service. In fact, speaking in my own regard, I, I'm giving two classes a day every day. And before I was never doing that, even when I was traveling and uh, more active, I was giving two classes a day, rarely, generally one class a day and sometimes no classes. So I've, I've found an increase in service. I've got more time for chanting now, so I'm using that. So there is always benefit in every material situation. As Prabhupada writes, uh, an, expert, an expert businessman will make profit when the price of rice goes up and when the price of rice goes down. And so that's, that's true. A devotee knows how to use every material situation to increase their, not only their devotional service, but increase their Krishna consciousness. So uh, that sometimes requires an adjustment in our lifestyle in order to adapt to the situation. So now one of the things that's happened to always in more contact with each other online. <laughs> so that's good. Another thing is that though devotees said who are in the temples together or can develop more closer relationships with each and every devotee. Maybe because we were so busy with so many services now, now we have more time to uh, spend time with, each, with the devotees and share Krishna consciousness together. These are the persons we are 
generally with, for those of us at home, family members are actually becoming, have an opportunity to become closer together. You can uh, spend more time with your children, with your husband and wife, like that. And also maybe work together as a family to and strengthen the family uh, activities, strengthen the family's relationships with each other. Of course, the non-devotees are going the opposite way because now a lot of them, instead of strengthening their families when they're in this situation, they're finding more opportunities to fight with one another. And that's a news report too. And the news is saying that there's more domestic violence now than ever before because the non-devotees are cooped up in their little homes and they can't move and so what is what is negative becomes even more negative and what is positive becomes more positive so devotees you know they can always take advantage of a situation to improve in whatever way the situation is pushing us so, so i don't see this whole thing as being you know so negative i see it as an opportunity to expand krishna consciousness in other areas And especially preaching to the non-devotees now is even better than ever. Hare Krishna. Okay. Shiv? Sushil, okay. Yeah, and it's asking how do we go about narrowing down the spiritual master without causing offense to the spiritual masters? How do we go about doing what to the spiritual master? I think it's selecting, as it's narrowing down the list of spiritual masters without causing offense to other spiritual masters. Well, if you're hunting for, you're looking for a spiritual master, then you might find yourself looking towards two or three different ones, maybe deciding amongst them. Um, it's no offense, whatever you, whoever you choose, that is your, your choice. The spiritual masters are not offended by who you choose and who you don't choose. <laughs> um, generally, a spiritual master is simply accepting the position to become a spiritual master for someone who wants them. But if someone else wants somebody else and not me as a spiritual master, hey, I'm happy for that. That's good. So I, and I wish them all well. Spiritual masters are not supposed to want to collect disciples or be known as having many disciples like that. It says that in the scriptures, spiritual masters do not canvas for disciples. That's against the that's against the etiquette of that position and can cause offense. So, in finding narrowing down, the best way to do it is to hear from two or three of different spiritual masters who you are inspired by, not more than that, and then maybe bringing it down to two, and eventually. Uh, keep hearing, see where you find the most inspiration, uh, speak to some of your, you know, your peers about, you know, how you should approach this whole thing. You may also take advice from them. And then ultimately you make a decision. So choosing the spiritual master is some is really through inspiration and that spiritual master that gives you that inspiration to surrender your life to krishna that's your spiritual master there are many spiritual masters who, who can inspire us in devotional service but that person who really inspires you from the core of your heart to want to give your life to krishna you can say that is your spiritual master. So you look for that. And the process of looking is the process of hearing.
So hear regularly as much as you can. Uh, I got one here. I'm stuck in a complete lockdown in the city in India without any association. I couldn't see the rest of the question, though. Okay. Well, we wish you well and uh, make your association through the media as best you can. Okay. Another question from Jagarup Mangdal is how to keep up Krishna conscious? That's easy. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Chant as much as you can. That'll keep up your Krishna consciousness. And serve devotees whenever the opportunity arises. Hare Krishna Maharaj, this is Sharad here. Hare Bol. Hare Bol. Just a, a, a small clarification. So how important is, um, you know, Anitya Karma, like Sandhya Vandanam, and other rituals that we perform are expected to perform as our duty compared to practicing bhakti. Can practicing bhakti alone uh, be enough for us to, uh, you know, please the Lord and, and uh, go back to the Godhead? Yeah. Or some of this Kutya Karma is equally important. No, it's mentioned in the Shastras, yeah. What is that verse? Devarshi putatma nirna putrina putkinkarayan nari narajam sarasya salam saralam mukunda mukunda green the pretty cartoon. It's from the 11th canto, chapter 5, verse number 32. In that verse, it explains that one who surrenders to mukunda. You know, it's Krishna, the Supreme Personality, then all responsibilities, all other debts to forefathers, to, uh, to sages, to the demigods, to people in general, even to one's parents, every, all the obligations are automatically, what we say, covered by our devotion to Krishna because that is the principle of the living entities life our life is meant to reach krishna consciousness so one who is on the path of krishna consciousness that becomes the only obligation like that so therefore it says in this age that the sacrifice in this age is harinam sankirtan krishna varnam tusa krishna sangapanga saparsadam yagnai sankirtanai pranai yajanti hi sumeda saha one who has good intelligence engages in the Sankirtan movement, and that alone can purify one's consciousness. So these other karma khandas, karma khanda, jnana khanda, are secondary, and people like to get into them because it's some kind of ritual. But ultimately, it's not necessary when one is engaged in bhakti. Like that. These karma khandas and these other rituals help to bring one from the lower stages to a higher stage where they can finally recognize the importance of bhakti. But if you recognize bhakti already as the most important, engage in that, then automatically you're taking care of all the responsibilities to all other aspects of society. <laughs> and that's confirmed by that verse, uh, 11532. You can look it up in Srimad Bhagavatam. It's also in Bhagavad Gita, chapter 2, verse number 39 in the purport. Prabhupada recites this verse and explains some of the principles related. So, uh, yeah. 
So, uh, bhakti is enough. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Thank you. Anything? Well, we are one-fifth of every activity performed. And that's mentioned in Gita in the 17th chapter, that all activities require five ingredients. Uh, the initiator, that might be you. Uh, the ingredients for the activity. Uh, the endeavor. The time, place, and circumstance and ultimately the super soul. So these five ingredients make up all activity. So therefore we, in one sense, I mean, Krishna says, in one, in one place he says you're not the doer, in another place he says you are the doer. <laughs> you can find that in Gita. The word kartam, kartam means kartaham itimanyate. In the third, third chapter he says you're not the doer. In the... Uh, I think in the 13th chapter, it, he mentions, uh, yeah, you're the, you're the observer, but still you have an element of activity while you're observing. So it, this is all complicated in the sense that it ultimately is that we are part of every action and not the complete action itself. So when when you look at it from the part, then you look at, well, I'm the doer. When you look at it from the complete whole, you look at it, I'm not the doer. So. You yeah, you need to read more on, on that one. If you read the, uh, the more about the, on, on the 13th chapter and also on the 17th chapter, you'll find some more points that are being explained. It's all based on, on angle of vision. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, anything else? I see we have 13 chats here. Kaili Vrindavan Devi Dasi, Hare Krishna. <laughs> We don't want to interfere with the next program. Does that start soon? The next one is at that six thirty. Yes, it's a half an hour, so if you, if you want we can carry on for maybe like ten minutes, five to ten minutes. I'm I'm happy to, yeah. Wow. No association at all. Get on the media. I hope you have your cell phone. Um, it's a little, you know, maybe um, where you, some of us are very much inspired by association. Some of us can do, do without and still continue. It depends. So, uh, um, with the time you have, read Srila Prabhupada's books more, chat more, and whenever you feel the need to uh, connect to the media, call other devotees. 
Um, you, if you, I think you said you were in Bombay. Is that the place? Iskam Pune. Well, you have two major temples there. Uh, Radhe Shyam Prabhu, from what I understand, every night is giving a class, uh, and he is he is you know very 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 uh, learned, and his classes are very inspiring. Um, yeah, we got we can think of things that we didn't do before because we were so busy. But now we have maybe more time to do it. And then right now, all we have is the media. And now we have to use it. If you read Prabhupada's books, you're associated with Prabhupada. And that association is real. It's not just some idea. Prabhupada said, if you want to associate with me, I'm in my books. Read my books. So we have a question coming here from the local area. Let's see. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, my question is this, um, the scriptures say glorification and criticism always fall short of the reality of the situation. And my question is, is there any uh, exception to this rule? Uh, is there a way we can glorify or praise, give praise uh, in order that um, the reality of the situation is considered, for example, including Krishna in the picture, the, or I don't know. Yeah, you can write books, <laughs> write articles. How do we, can we actually glorify Prabhupada? It always falls short. Can you understand the glories of the holy name? Not possible. <laughs> can you understand the bad qualities of the demons? Pretty hard. Prabhupada used to say, for the demons, there's nothing they won't do to satisfy their selfish interests. So he gives a general statement. <laughs> so, you know, when you find either one of these two things, criticism or negativity, uh, criticism or praise, you can find, you can always say that it's, there's much more to the picture than one, any individual can speak about. Okay. Any other questions? We still have about 10 more minutes before we can conclude, right? We'll stop at quarter after six. Okay. Okay. So maybe one more question, and then we'll end the session. Hare Krishna. Please, can I ask a question? Of course, of course, of course. Hare Krishna, Maharaj. So nice to see you. My my obeisances to you, Mataji. I'm so happy to see your name come up on my screen. <laughs> Neither am I, so I guess we're both in, we both got something wrong with us. 
Uh, no, I'm I'm missing association with certain devotees who I who who I really were close to, but other than that, I find this I'm always interacting with devotees through the media. So that association is there. If you're feeling content in Krishna consciousness and in the way you're carrying it on, then that is an indication itself that it's fine. I don't think there's anything wrong with you. Thank you, Thank you. And your whole family are all devotees anyway, so you, you got a lot of association. <laughs> Okay, so we'll stop here. Thank you very much, Mahaprabhu, for organizing this this opportunity to speak. <laughs> and we'll look forward to tomorrow. Yeah, thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Just um quickly say Mark giving a class again tomorrow, so it's four forty five UK time tomorrow. And uh, also on Monday at 9.30 UK time. So 4.45 tomorrow UK time and 9.30 on Monday UK time. So please do join us again. All the Zoom, all the uh, details on Zoom are the same. Please do join us again. Thank you very much. Hope you've managed. Uh, <laughs>